I want to start with a slightly provocative question. Is there any way that, in terms of access to the single market, the UK's new relationship with the EU can be better than what it's had, you know, as, 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 as a member? Well, I argued during the referendum that the benefits of being in the single market for Britain and for its financial services were clear and strong, and I think it has benefited from being in the single market. But the fact is that there's been a big decision that's been taken by the British people. Uh, that's a decision you have to respect. I think there is no going back on that. And now what people need to do in the UK is make the most of that and look for new opportunities that maybe weren't there before and work out how you deal with the new situation. So I think in a way uh, they've been thinking in a certain way for the last 40 years and now they need to reimagine a kind of whole economic model with financial services at the heart of it. Okay, you've talked about the Norwegian model. That's uh, outside of the European Union, but the Norwegians still have access to the single market. They've agreed on some other things that might be non-starters, like freedom of movement. Uh, they pay into the EU. They, they're subject to EU laws. But you've said that there is an intellectual inconsistency, to use a quote, in going for that approach. Explain that. Well, I think the, the, the deal that the Norwegians had, uh, I think, works for the Norwegians, but they don't have such a developed financial services sector, obviously, as the UK. And the basic deal is they have to sign up to rules, but they don't have much influence over that rulemaking. But the fact is, as I've said, that the British people have decided that they want a different future. And so now, I, I, I don't think of this as being one kind of model that you've got to take off the peg like you're buying a suit in a, in a shop. Uh -huh. I think you've got to do the whole intellectually rigorous process of working out what your priorities are, what you want your economy to be shaped like, the role that financial services will play, and then have a, you know, a complicated negotiation with the rest of Europe as to how you can best deliver what you can, and then also think about, I think, domestic policy tools uh, that might be needed to compensate for some of the things that you might be losing. Like reducing the uh, corporation tax, for example, that we already saw. What do you say to the financial firms operating in the city who are saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and my guess is the best that the UK can get outside of the EU is not going to be as good as it is now. What would you say to them? I'd say get your thinking caps on and be part of the process whereby uh, Britain, the British government, uh, needs to rethink what its offer is. And I think that with the expertise that they have, knowing how the markets work, knowing how international trade works, knowing what it is that attracts people to London, they need to come up with um, you know, the, the, their top asks and work with the government to come up with a proper strategy. And how long do you think it's going to take for them to get the clarity that they're looking for? Yeah, I think it's hard at the moment to be clear years, on. Three it's years, hard, five. To, hard to be clear on the length of time. Clearly, there's pressure in the rest of Europe for this process to start. Sure. But it's also the case in the UK that we've got a new prime minister starting tomorrow. Uh, they have to go through the process, I think, of, that I've described before you're in a position where you come to the rest of Europe with, your, uh, with a set of you know, initial proposals. So I think no one wants to make it take longer than it needs to. But I think at the minute, setting a time frame until you've done your homework is quite hard. But I think people won't want uncertainty to last any longer than, uh, than it has to. Do you see a role for yourself as part of the UK's negotiating team? I have no thoughts about any role for myself other than uh, when I go here on Friday, going back to my garden, um, <laughs> digging it <laughs> and cultivating my, yeah. uh, my garden. Have you had a chance to talk to the, the new Prime Minister? No. I mean, that's, or as you know, the, the situation in Britain's been developing very fast. Sure. The, the soon-to-be <laughs> new Prime Minister didn't know they were going to be the soon-to-be new Prime Minister until yesterday tea time. Yeah. So <laughs> things are moving fast. I'm over here in Brussels. I've got a job to do for the next few days, trying to set a future path for financial regulation. I mean, you know where the bodies lie. You know how it's all organized here. Who do you think should, should lead the UK's negotiating That's team? That's not for me to say. There are lots of people over there who are smart, who uh, will be keen to do it. And uh, my only uh, contribution, I think, is to say that on both sides of this, on the British side and on the side of the rest of Europe, we need to find a process that enables 
what are going to be hard discussions to take place in a grown-up fashion. Yeah. And that people who take contrary views and escalate the rhetoric uh, is not going to help. And we don't want an outcome where people end up on either side cutting off their nose to spite their face. That's why I think we need to calm things down, take our time, keep it steady in the kind of way, actually, that Mrs. Merkel in Germany has been suggesting. There's a lot of confusion about Article 50, and you know, if you listen here in Brussels, they say Article 50 has to be invoked, has to be invoked before we actually begin any negotiations. Theresa May has talked about how it would be useful to have some informal negotiations <laughs> first. You know, in the real world, in an informal fashion with member states, do you think it's possible that the UK can get started in this process, you know, with a dialogue with important members now, or does it have to really wait well, until I, next I, year, like yeah. Theresa May has been talking I about? I think all of that stuff will become clear. I mean, you're absolutely right that the position uh, that um, the European Council and the European Commission has taken is that uh, until Article 50 starts, they don't want to start the process of negotiation. And I think one has to respect that's what they've said. Um, how it pans out in the real world, people have telephones, you know, I, um, I can't uh, foresee. But clearly, I think everyone would want to be in a position where you can start that process of negotiation as soon as both sides are ready to do so, uh, because I don't think it's going to be quick. Uh, and I think, therefore, the sooner you start, uh, the better that is for everyone.